Hey everyone at Comic-Con at home, my name is Steve Weintraub. I'm editor-in-chief of the website Collider. I'm super excited to be moderating this panel for Antlers with Guillermo del Toro and director Scott Cooper. Uh, before we get into the panel, Searchlight Pictures has provided us with an exclusive featurette that actually features never-before-seen footage. Check it out. As soon as the featurette is over, the panel's gonna start. Can anyone give me an example of a myth or a story they're afraid of. Antlers tells the story of the Native American mythology of the Wendigo. The Wendigo is an allegory where there's a spirit that comes to reconcile what the people are doing incorrectly. All this rage, all this abuse incarnates. It's like an invocation for this creature. The Windigo translates to a diabolical wickedness that, uh, that devours mankind. The Windigo myth was born out of this notion that when the English settled, they cannibalized all of the resources, leaving the Native Americans essentially to starve. Big Bear got sick, and his insides turned black. Our images of the Windigo it didn't become just allegories. It actually started becoming very, very real. He's not dead. He'll come for me. The destruction of families, that was always the analogy for the monster is. It's truly a powerful connection between what we do to nature, what we do to each other. It is a metaphor made flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, producer Guillermo del Toro and director Scott Cooper. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Very good, man. Yeah, surviving. Sometimes spraying at the edges. It was hanging hard in the office. Right. Guillermo doesn't have a bad backdrop today. He, he's doing okay. <laughs> oh, I love Guillermo's places. Look at that. So we're all here for antlers, but um, I have a few other fun questions to loosen things up to get started. What TV series would both of you like to guest write and direct? Uh, of all times for me, you know, my favorite is still is Night Gallery. Cold Check, The Night Stalker, uh, any, any of the series I saw as a, as a young kid. It was a golden era with Jeff Rice, Rod Serling, uh, the, the, the fantastic uh, TV movies and TV series in the 70s, Trilogy of Terror, you know, uh, Don't Be Afraid of the Dark. It was a beautiful time. What movie do you guys think you've seen the most? It's cliche for me to say Godfather, Godfather 2, or, or something like Jaws, because every time I turn the TV on, those are on, literally and I can't stop myself regardless of where we are in the film. Um, uh, but for a film that I would seek out, Coppola is, is one of my favorite directors, but as a, as a film that I would seek out to watch over and over and over uh, would be his film, The Conversation. At least dozens. I would say Creature from the Black Lagoon, Frankenstein, Rogue Warrior. Uh, to me, the Lewin Davis, Inside Lloyd Davis, uh, Catch Me If You Can, and mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg Zool. You know, they, they, they're in constant rotation. And uh, Blade Runner, I mean, it's, I see at least fragments of 10 movies every day, and at least <laughs> three movies every day. So it's hard. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I, uh, I know, Guillermo, you're a big fan of Disneyland. Uh, do you guys have a favorite ride at Disneyland? <laughs> yeah, of course. Haunted Mansion. <laughs> Why did I think you would say that? Oh, no. Listen, that's an easy one. Yeah, and sadly for me, I've never been. Wow. I know. Oh, Wait, are you serious? Yes. I know. It's, it's, it's tragic. Um, and not out of, out of not wanting to go. I just, for whatever reason, never found myself uh, at Disneyland. And that's uh, maybe one of my regrets. 
Well, you can still do it, man. Yes. I go, I go no, I'll, I'll, you're my guest. Let's do it. I would love it. And look, uh, I, I beg for people to come with me to this event. <laughs> well, in fact, you've invited me, Guillermo. To come uh, I'll, go, I'll go alone at the drop of a hat. I've been alone in Disneyland many, many times, uh, but I'll, I'll go anytime you want. Oh, I love it. Thank you. For me, the strange combination is the, the three filmmakers that influenced me the most would be Disney, Hitchcock, and Buñuel, you know? So it's a, and, and, and strangely, the three of them intersect somehow. Well, and they, you know where they intersect is in your work. I mean, I can easily see that. You've never told me that, Guillermo, but, but now that you mention that, I can absolutely see that. Well, they intersect also. Dali worked with Disney, Dali worked with Buñuel. I think Hitchcock and Buñuel have a lot in common to me. Marnie, mm. Marnie is a Buñuel film. Yeah. You know, and Vertigo is a Buñuel film in a strange way. And uh, in, the terms, in terms of Buñuel, the movie L is a Hitchcock film, easily. Yeah, I can easily see that in your work. If you guys could get the financing together, like someone would give you the green light on a project uh, right now, uh, what project would you make and why? You know, any time that I decide to, to make a film, there's something else just before I say yes to myself or to someone else. In my drawer, there's something else that I say, that's the thing I should be making, not the thing I'm about to say yes to. Oh, of course. My wife thinks that I'm commitment phobic because making films is so terribly difficult and so terribly personal and takes so much out of you on in, in, in many different regards. There's a film that, that I've wanted to make for um, several years that I've written about a series of murders that take place at West Point uh, in the year 1830. And they surround this young cadet who is, unlike all of the other cadets, he is, he's poetic, he's irrational, he's at times fanciful, and he's extremely passionate. And the world would come to know this young cadet as Edgar Allan Poe. We should make sure you make it. <laughs> yes. I want Guillermo producing all of my films. I'll say that. I will, I will produce it. But, you know, me, I would, do, I would do either Mountains of Madness or Frankenstein, which I've always ambitioned as uh, a two to three part uh, story, you know, because in order to encompass the book, you have to change points of view. And it's a complicated, it's a complex exercise. But you know what you were saying, which is funny, Scott, is every filmmaker I know, at least once or twice in their lifetime, but some of us every time, you've always, you go to the movie, you're starting the movie, and it looks like you should be making any other movie except the one you're making. Yes. And that you made a terrible mistake at, at choos choosing this one. Well, because we know what it, what it takes to actually get the film mounted, to marshal all the forces. Uh, well, that, that, means, that happens on the beginning, and it, it's always, if you start a movie without absolute dread, uh, you're, not, you're not a filmmaker, I yeah, think. Right. I mean, you have to have all the preparation in the world. It's like launching a spaceship. Yes. The, you know, you check the rocket, you, the, the astronauts go through intense preparation, but the moment the countdown goes four, three, two, there's a moment where you go, this is going to explode, we're going to burn, this, we're going to explode in the uh, stratosphere, the <laughs> rocket is going to something. And that, that moment elongated in a few days or weeks is what you feel as a filmmaker. You prepared everything, but the thing is alive now. Well, it's true. And you know, Guillermo, I didn't go to film school, so my film education is watching lots of movies, lots of director commentary, and lots of director's interviews. And, and all of the directors that I admire um, the world over have all said that their least favorite part of actually making a film is shooting and that they love the writing or working on the screenplay and certainly in cutting because there's so much pressure. Well, editing, editing is fantastic because the editing is you're typing with the most expensive typewriter in the world. That's right. It comes with words already formed but it costs millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands, depending on what you're doing. But no doubt, you're typing 
with image and sound. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, the, the thing that I do miss, I do miss audio commentaries. I mean, I, I'm a believer in, in the physical medium for movies, DVDs and Blu-rays, uh, only like 10, 10 feet away from here. I, I, I have personally alphabetized uh, 7,000 movies that I, I, that I love to access and watch uh, as you would a, a library. Like you want to read Walt Whitman or you want to read uh, uh, Ulysses, you want to, you, you pull the book out, you know, you, you watch. And every day we, we try to watch, that's why we would try to watch every day three movies, three movies a day. Incredible. Well, nobody has the, the, the uh, film knowledge, uh, at least that I've been around, that you have, Guillermo, so I, I see why. No, it's fun. I think, I think we, what you say, you learn. The other day I, I was texting with a, a filmmaker I admire, and uh, he, I, he said, oh, I love that you keep the physical medium. And I said, because I watch the extras, and I listen to the audio commentary. Uh, you know, and sometimes I listen to it twice because I forget, and you know, and and it's so beautiful. And I was, it was, so, it's it's been great. I mean, we've been texting during the the quarantine, and I've been texting with other filmmakers, you know, and I've been able to 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 ask them what they are watching and why they are watching it. It's been it's been a fantastic learning experience. This this quarantine indoors oh yeah in in many regards certainly certainly makes it uh, uh makes you realize what's what's important and and if anything it really makes you think about how important time is and if you're going to make a film you better really want to make it and, and you know what is is if you study film if you really study a filmmaker you admire uh you can then you can actually break down mm, their use of the lens, their use of composition, depth of field, uh, com anything you want, movement of camera, movement of actors, anything you want. And, and if you put the time, then that's a new tool in your toolbox. You do it differently, but, it, but, but as a tool, like I remember we were doing Devil's Backbone and my cinematographer, Guillermo Navarro, there's a shot where the kids hear an explosion and I, I had put the dolly track in the middle of the group, and I was pushing past their faces with a mini jib, and Guillermo said, "Oh, next time you can, let's get a hothead, and let's 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 get a a, a techno crane, and push really push without touching the floor." And we made it a point to get a techno for Blade Two, <laughs> and I repeated <laughs> the move in another sequence, and I went, "Oh, that's what, you know, and that's a new tool that you keep." You know, you, 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 you learn to use them. Again, that's how I kind of self-teach is watching other filmmakers. Certainly the Coen brothers, Fincher, you, I mean, in turn, and I watch it with the sound off. And then, and the, for me, the Coens, um, I mean, the, the Coens as good as it gets. The Coens are, for me, the best living filmmakers. Yeah, I would agree. Right now. Um, um, uh, simply in, in how, I mean, they're superb uh, storytellers. Uh, but they are the ones that hold the most mystery for me. Some of the things they do, uh, you know, go beyond. They're just pure, pure faith, pure poetry. And I and I don't know. I mean, I've interviewed them a couple of times. I serve as a juror with them in Cannes, and I interviewed them every time I could. Uh, you know, I would ask them this and that, and you know, I can tell you things they do, but their instincts are. All their own. And utterly mysterious. And utterly not, mysterious. not a wasted movement with camera, with dialogue, mise-en-scene, nothing. Brilliant, brilliant. Jumping into why you guys are doing Comic-Con at home, for people that don't know much about the film, what do you want to tell them about it? It's a good question. I would say, uh, for me, that it's really about... The film looks at the horrors of what it means to be an individual in America today and all of the crises that we're facing, quite frankly. Climate crisis, drug-addicted populace, uh, our treatment of uh, Native Americans, um, abject poverty, all those sort of things without hopefully feeling like a message film, but wrapped into, uh, into, a, into a monster film. 
I think that horror is contextual always. And the, the texture of the movie, I mean, it's, it's a proper, it, it, look, it, it's based on a short story, but you, you made it very different because it became Scott Cooper universe, you know? For better or worse. <laughs> no, no, for good. I, and and uh, speaking of which, that was one of the things. People say, why do you produce? And I say, I produce to, to learn from the filmmakers, you know? And, and uh, I, I, I told you this, I was watching your dailies mm. religiously and I would, I would say, this is a beautiful moment, this is a beautiful movement, this is a beautiful, but I, I said, where is, there's a certain energy in between the spaces that your films have. And I said, where is that in this one? Where is that Scott Cooper-esque uh, moment? And then you showed me your first assembly and I went, oh, <laughs> That's a Scott Cooper movie. <laughs> so it, it exists in the same world and out of the furnace for me, in a way. You know, uh, I, to me, it's, um, it's a continuation of your preoccupations, but it's a proper horror tale. Uh, thanks for saying that about Out of the Furnace, uh, a very um, personal film for me. Uh, and I had another monster in that, uh, Woody Harrelson, who's quite scary, I have to say. Um, but this is my first immersion into the into the supernatural. I think with each movie, I want to be on unfamiliar ground because I think risk is one of the great pleasures of of making art, making films. I think horror films are for people who are kind of interested in the darkness inside themselves who don't want to face it or confront it directly. And I think it can provide a kind of an environment for people to escape. I, I recall my brother, who's, who's much older, taking me to see John Carpenter's Halloween for the first time in a, in a theater. And I left utterly terrified at realizing what film could do to you, uh, even at a young age. And I think anytime you can do that, you can move the audience, whether it be a gangster film or a film about an aging country musician or Out of the Furnace or even a Western. Um, I think that's the goal. And, and for me, I think... Uh, this genre allowed me to do it because I said to Guillermo, uh, first of all, I wouldn't have made the film if Guillermo wasn't producing it, firstly. And I said to Guillermo, I said, you know, my goals for this film is for it to be disquieting, for it to be tense and human at its center, but also terrifying. And, you know, the audience will be the judge, but those were the goals. Yeah. One of the things that I thought you did a great job with, one of the many things, is that you touched on it already. The, the film has a message without being a, a message film. It's very, it's layered in, it's in the subtext, but it's clearly there. Yeah, I'm not a fan of, of certainly of message movies. I mean, my hope is that when people, if they happen to see my films more than once, um, they'll see that there, there's something very subtle that will come to the fore that maybe you missed the first time. And in this particular film, um, while I wanted it to be really quite horrific and terrifying, and I think certainly at moments that it is, I wanted us to really feel like what it is to be an American today and also to show the world as it really is. You have a young boy, that you, you see this in the trailer, so it's not much, of a, uh, not much of a spoiler. You see a young boy who's in a great deal of pain, um, who's dealing with a lot of familial issues, and that's one of the themes in the film. But you'll also understand that the... Um, that the Wendigo um, figures into the film. And we know that that is um, Native American. Well, as, as I thought, it was somewhat of, a, um, somewhat of an allegory or, or some type of folklore. But as it turns out, my Native American advisors said that First Nations in, in Canada and Native Americans really, really believe in it. So, the Wendigo figures into, into the story. And, and, and the Wendigo, we know, is this murderous spirit that's, that's summoned by nature to seek vengeance on a callous mankind that has abused it. And it's clear that we're abusing Mother Earth. As I mentioned, we're abusing uh, Native Americans uh, we have since we first came to the shores of America. And then also abusing uh, drugs and the opioid crisis. And, and so that really just kind of hovers underneath underneath the surface because the Wendigo represents greed and colonialism. I think there's two things that I was very compelled in the myth is the, the Wendigo, the more it eats, the more hungry it gets. 
Yes. And the more it eats, the weaker it gets. And there's a, there is a metaphor for the insatiability that exists right now and the permanent deprivation of everything we, we live in. And, and there's a lot of family rage in the movie. There's a lot of, uh, every character in the movie is enacting or suffering from family rage of some kind. And ultimately, it's a bunch of broken characters attempting to get together. And I think that was one of the things I loved about what you did. I mean, we worked very close. We worked very, it's one of the great pleasures to have produced this movie with you. And I really was very happy the way you wove that rage. Ultimately, is would you, if, if you loved something, uh, would you be able to kill it, you know, if it if needed be? And that's the central question in the movie. Uh, or would you preserve it alive? And in a strange way, it's something that is very personal for me too, uh, because uh, it's the first question I asked in Kronos, my first movie, about a girl keeping the vampire grandpa in an attic. And I thought, this has echoes of that for me. But I mean, obviously, I didn't mention it or tried to do it. You came to it alone. Yeah, but it all, it, and, and, and look at Pan's Labyrinth. So it's clear that, that, it, that it touched a nerve uh, with you in, in a great way. And, and one of the pleasures of working with Guillermo is that when you have a producer who's also a director, and I've had Ridley Scott and Tony Scott produce and Robert Duvall, so it's, it's not the first time that I've had a director produce, but they really understand what you're going through on a daily basis. Oh, yes. Prep, through shooting, <laughs> through cutting. Guillermo is always available. He's extremely generous with his time. And any time that I would have a script question, certainly when I was shooting at night, I would email him or text him. Uh, but in the creation of, of the Wendigo, I mean, there's, there's no one better than Guillermo at, at that, which is why I said I would only make this film with, with him. But it's really wonderful to have someone who really knows what, what you're going through in the most difficult of times, I have to say. You had Native American consultants on the film. Yep. Can you sort of talk about why uh, that was important to you? If we go back one film before this, Hostiles, the Western that I made with Christian Bale, um, it was really important for me as, as someone who's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Episcopalian raised to, if I'm going to discuss any Native American um, folklore, any themes that course through Native American life, I want to have people who know much more about it than I, and I want to get it right. So I had consultants from Hostiles to this film. One of them is actually a wonderful Native American filmmaker named Chris Eyre, who directed Smoke Signals, uh, which was recently, um, uh, I think, admitted into the Library of Congress. Fantastic movie. Yeah, and he's a wonderful guy, and he's a close pal of mine, and he has really helped me understand Native American causes. And then uh, I reached out to Grace Dillon, who is a professor, a professor of Indigenous Studies at Portland State University, and, and considered to be the foremost authority on the Wendigo in America. And she was the one who really educated me that, oh, no, Native Americans, First Nations, it's not folklore for them. It's not a myth. They truly, truly believe in it because it yeah. represents greed and colonialism when we first came to the shores of what is now America and pillaged all of their resources and forced them uh, to cannibalism, uh, that taste of human flesh, which out of that rose the Wendigo. Um, so just on a psychological and emotional level and, and uh, just understanding Native American plight because those causes for me are incredibly uh, important. Um, and no, no mistake that two films in a row for me deal with Native Americans. So both Grace Dillon and Chris Eyre were uh, incredibly helpful. A lot of people are going to be curious about the actual creature in the film. Maybe you can share how you guys designed the creature, how it came together. Well, well the, the, the Wendigo has very, very specific cues you need to follow. Uh, and, and I mean, the way it's described and the way it's, uh, it has a, uh, you have to follow the, the, those precepts. So the antlers, for example, are a must, you know, and there is, uh, there is, um, you, what, what I remember very clearly when I was working with uh, Scott and Guy Davis, and later with, the, with everybody at Legacy creating the creature, I said, we have to remember we're not creating a monster. We're creating a god. 
Yeah, that's right. So the design needs to have elements that are completely unnatural, you know, that are almost surreal or abstract. For example, we, you remember that moment when we, they were trying realistic paint jobs, you remember? Yes. Like the bone looked like bone and the yes. fur looked like fur. And I said, no, the bone needs to look like, uh, like coal. Yeah, coal. Or. Or, yeah. yeah like, like, the, like the mine. What I love is that he didn't approach it, uh, you know, with, uh, with any fear, you know. He approached it with some glee and, 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 and that allowed everybody to bring to the table the best, uh, their best game. But we said very clearly, we cannot have a monster. We have to see him and say it looks ancient, powerful, and one with nature. So those were the things that we were doing. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible learning experience for me, obviously having worked, never having worked with a monster or, or um, uh, even a concept artist, Guy Davis, who works with Guillermo quite closely, he would sketch concepts and uh, continual refinement from Guillermo and me. And Guillermo thought on a much, much deeper level, which is if, if we're talking about what this is, this murderous spirit is doing to the earth, it comes from the center of the earth, its crust, its ore, its ember. And the Wendigo looks like that. I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful uh, design. Um, and then Shane Mahan at Legacy, who was a creature effects supervisor, um, kind of a costume animatronic uh, uh, hybrid of techniques, uh, which they worked on Avatar and Jurassic and Terminator. and Aliens. Yeah, I mean, they really took what Guy, Guillermo, and I created on the page and, and made this uh, in record time and not a lot of money. Uh, an incredibly yeah. compelling uh, God. And quite frankly, one of my all-time favorite films in a film that I watched often while shooting this was is Ridley's uh, Alien, for many reasons. I think it's a masterful film. Um, but uh, Guillermo and uh, the folks at Legacy, I think, created something that's wholly unique. And then what, what we did, and we knew it from the start, we said, uh, Mr. X is going to be 50-50. We're going to have the monster physical but we're going to enhance it, which is what I've been doing since Mimic. Since 1997, I've been doing this. I take a practical creature and little portions of it become digital, you know? In the case of Shape of Water, the eyes would blink, uh, the micro expressions of the face, blah, blah, blah. In the case of Blade 2, the upper portion was makeup, the, the opening jaws were digital some, most of the time. And, and and we did the same approach here. We said let's let's base it on the puppet and and the performer. And then one moment the the puppet has the right arm is completely digital, or the mouth is completely digital, and and that I think uh, keeps the eye distracted. There's a scene in the movie that involves a a younger actor, a kid, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, it's pretty bloody. It, could you talk about the vibe on set and what it's like to direct someone who, you know, it's, it's adult material? Well, I remember when, when Guillermo and I were uh, just working together in, in Vancouver before we started shooting, he said to me, he said, Scott, the two things that you shouldn't do, because I've done them, that makes your life difficult, is to work with kids and a monster. And I had two children and a monster. But in this particular instance, like I, I would imagine the young girl in Pan's Labyrinth, um, the actors in this film had, this was their first part. Um, uh, was that the case in Pan's, Guillermo? Uh, relatively. I mean, she had done other parts, but no starring roles. Well, we, in the process of casting that particular part, I think we saw between 900 and 1,000 young boys. And there was a quality that I was looking for that I wasn't quite finding because so many child actors are groomed by their parents to become stars. You see them in all these TV shows filled with young actors and their performances ring inauthentic for me. So I wanted to find a kid who had never seen a film camera and after searching on every continent, uh, I think, in the world, we, we act, we, we found him. And because I have two young daughters, one about his age, I knew how to, how to communicate with him. And he felt after a certain amount of time, he felt safe around all of us. Um, but I think some of the reactions that you're seeing from him are genuine reactions because, uh, as you know, the film is filled with a great deal of shadow and, 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 um, 
he's dealing as, as Guillermo touched on with some, some familial rage and kind of the, the breakdown of the nuclear family. So it, it was not a, a, an easy shoot for him, but you just really have to make sure that they trust you and that they know that, um, that you will always be there for them and never put them in a situation that can be frightening. But, but uh, psychologically, it's a tough part for him. And, and personally, I think uh, as child actors go, I think his performance, Jeremy Thomas is his name, uh, is one of the best I've seen. But also, also remember uh, that in, in a movie, you see a 20-second scene that is terrifying, uh, but it took all day to shoot. Yes. So, you know, you, the, the child actor is going to see the, the monster guy in the suit eating a bagel with some coffee. <laughs> He's going to see him sit on his chair. He's going to see him have to go to the honey wagon. You know, it's like, it, 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 it takes a lot of that uh, energy uh, down, you know. So shooting becomes very prosaic. And as long as you treat the actors with uh, respect, no matter what age, respect, care, and they feel that no matter what, they're in good hands and they're intelligent hands, uh, they, 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 they become great partners. I was at one time an actor with a, an unremarkable career and um, I tend to, and this can be really dangerous, I tend to write for certain actors and have actors in mind. Um, I did it with Jeff Bridges on Crazy Heart, uh, written two films for Christian Bale and actually a couple more that he and I are going to make. Um, and in this particular film, uh, I work with Jesse Plemons. This is our third film together and, and Rory Cochran. Um, and I had Carrie Russell in mind uh, for a long time simply because she is um, such a relatable actor and someone who is really open, not only with the audience, you see it in her work, but also with all the filmmakers, the other actors, will completely put you at ease. And I felt that she was someone that the audience, and the audience has a certain contract with her. They, they I think since her television show, Felicity, people have always really loved Carrie. And it seemed really fresh to see her uh, as a teacher who's coming back to this small town in, in Oregon, And she hasn't been there since she left for reasons that will become known um, later in the film uh, to reconnect with her brother, played by Jesse Plemons. Because I have been an actor, um, I think, and speak the same language, it's, it's really, um, for me, quite a pleasure and, and quite easy. I'm, I'm curious, jumping into cinematography, um, for both of you, can you talk about the use of coverage in your films? How often are you doing like multiple cameras? And how often are you doing like the Roger Deakins method of using one camera and no coverage, just having that one shot to work with in the edit? Yeah, well, I generally don't shoot with more than one. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll squeeze a second one in if it isn't going to uh, corrupt the, the, the main image. Uh, but generally, I don't shoot a lot of a lot of uh, coverage. I don't do a lot of uh, rehearsal either. So it's a little bit like a live wire experience of of really getting it in between action and and cut. Um, and with each film, I'm just learning to tell the story much more uh, with the camera and without dialogue. And certainly, the mise en scene, uh, Guillermo is much more experienced uh, than I am, having made as many films as he has, but I generally uh, defer to uh, what uh, Deacon's, uh, his methodology had, um, served me. I've done mostly single camera films because I find that brings precision, you know? But you can use uh, multiple cameras with great precision. I, I remember there was one shot, uh, one sequence on Blade 2 that I shot with 13 cameras On, on, on a single take, wow. and then one, one turnaround with three or four cameras, a couple of pops, and we were done. Because it was, we couldn't do it twice. Like Crimson Peak, or Shape of Water, or, or Pan's Labyrinth, those are single camera films, Devil's Backbone, you know, and, and you, you do it, you do them symphonically, you do them more, more, more like a melody. You know, learn a lot. in a movie like Pacific Rim, you're going to need it, especially in the action scene. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because, you, the, the, for example, if, no question. if, if you're going to shake the whole set, you want the actors to, to have, you, you, you want the positions to be the same, blah, blah, blah. Shooting with kids, sometimes it merits two cameras. 
because you you're gonna get something and it's unrepeatable sometimes. Yeah, you know? and you have less time to work with children. Oh yeah, yeah. much much less. So you know, uh, I I think, but but I don't do what you would call coverage. Coverage, I think, is for directors that find the rhythm in the editing room, and it's a certain type of director. If you, if, if, but I like to to find the final form in the editing room, but but the main shape is already dictated by the camera and the actors. Yeah. Can you talk about where in the scripting phase are you thinking about camera movement? What's your process for figuring out what the camera will do during your movie? Suddenly I write Maria, who's at the door. She, dash, steps in, you know? And every dash means for me a cut or a movement, and I'm kind of imagining it roughly. Uh, you, cre you you sort of envision it on the page, then you storyboard it or you storyboard it by yourself, then you rehearse with actors, and every one of those steps, you throw the one before out the window or you preserve it. I think if something better comes in, if an actor says, look, I know you want me against the window, but what if I don't get up? What if I stay here and, and shuffle the cards? And you go, that's a great idea, and you got to throw everything out the window, or you say, no, 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 no. You have to be at the window because of this and that. So I think the beauty of camera is that it's used, lens and camera are like brush strokes. You're either far or you're close. You are, you are on a long lens or you're on, an, on a wide angle. Each of them uh, really brings a whole series of adjectives, qualifiers of the image. It's not style, it's substance. Yeah, that's, that's, I generally start it with the script stage. Same way. I mean, it all, Clearly, it has to has to alter alter if if Christian Bale says, "Yeah, I want to sit here and shuffle the cards," and you have this idea that he's going to get up and you're going to follow him over to the window. He's going to open up the drapes and look down to the street, and we're going to cut to his POV. That may not happen if Christian says, "I'm going to sit at the table and we're going. I'm going to shuffle cards, and everything's going to play non-verbally." But in the writing stage, for me, much like Guillermo, it's through adjectives or even sometimes, I don't know that anybody else would want to direct my screenplays. I write them, I write camera moves in or, or um, we'll talk about what uh, an actor will do or a character will do in, in the scene. But then once you get there and you rehearse it with the actors, uh, unless it's something that you're really locked into with storyboards, for me, I, the mise-en-scene will, uh, will uh, really become very important in the rehearsal just the blocking, camera blocking with the actors once they understand really what it is they're gonna do in the scene that might be different than what I've anticipated because you really want them to be uh, a partner in, in how the scene plays out. And then you'll know where, once you have where you're gonna place your, your, your first opening shot in that particular scene, the rest of it for me kind of falls into place. And, and then we'll be motivated by their movement as to, or what, the, what the, the crux of the scene is, whether the camera's pushing in or pulling back, uh, lens selection, all those sort of things. And in this one, I shot for the first time, as I mentioned, digitally, but I shot on this, uh, a new camera at the time, a Sony Venice that's a very large format, almost like shooting 65 millimeter, because we, the young boy who's at the heart of this story, I kept saying to Florian, our cinematographer, little boy, big problems and you can see him in the frame sometimes completely overwhelmed by nature or the windigo or fog or mountains um so all those sort of things i'm writing into the script and then hopefully we can take it from the script stage and 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 visualize it in a way that uh moves the audience without their knowing it what are you writing right now what do you think might be your next project it's always in question because of actor availability, vaccine, what actors might want to work uh, before there's a vaccine and only uh, therapeutics. Uh, I can say that um, Christian, uh, who's, you know, my Christian Bale, my closest pal and, and uh, closest collaborator, he and I have uh, a couple of films together that uh, we are certain we're going to make uh, pending time. Uh, I've written a piece that Elizabeth Moss is uh, going to star in, and um, I'm working on uh, something uh, now. So I'm not quite sure what will be next, but uh, maybe it's something with Elizabeth or with uh, Christian. I just have to ask you one thing, because I've been I'm wondering about this with a lot of directors who are shooting right now. How does it work with the pandemic 
And because everyone was scheduled, so like for Nightmare Alley, you're scheduled to shoot from say January to June. Let's just use those as arbitrary dates. And then you have to push because of the pandemic. How does it work when these actors are committed to other projects later in the year? Does everyone sort of have first allegiance to the project they had to go back to? How does that work? We've been going through more schedules than ever. You know, you have to, it is, I was saying that the other day. I mean, the blessing of having this cast is uh, amazing, but the difficulties of rescheduling with all this are enormous because everybody is on demand. Everybody is going everywhere and you have to work around everybody's schedule. And, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things I like to, to think is that uh, for every problem in any movie, there is one simple and graceful solution. Sometimes you, you don't see it right away, but I think we've, we've found the silver bullet, so to speak, knock on wood, you know, uh, the, to make it work, but, but it, it is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy also simply uh, to anticipate how the set is going to move because we're taking every precaution, you know. It's basically you're operating a large uh, surgical theater. You know, you're, you're like, you're, you have to be sterile. You have to have everybody in conditions that are almost clinical, but at the same time, you have to reenact the carnival with the extras and everything. So the way you approach it is different. The way you stage with the extras, the way you stack them, the way you hire them, for example, you know, extras are hired by the day normally. Now you're going to buy them out for many, many weeks. And a lot of the time they're going to be down, but you want them exclusively because you don't want them to go from your set to a comedy in space and then they come back and they didn't quarantine. So you're basically buying them for a period and say, you're going to be monogamous with our movie. You know, you're not going to go and shoot three series and come back on Wednesday. So, I mean, there's, there's about dozens and dozens of pages of caution that we had to really consider. And, you know, I'll tell you on the other end. I mean, my feeling is this is going to go on hopefully for another few months and shooting is going to be interesting. I find that filmmaking is the art of extracting beauty from adversity. Uh, for everyone watching this panel at home right now, I want to give a huge thank you to Scott Cooper, uh, Guillermo del Toro, for joining us uh, to talk about antlers and filmmaking. And I think that everyone who's watching at Comic-Con at home, I'm sure is giving a round of applause and saying thank you and everything. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for doing this. And please stay safe and healthy. Pleasure. See you later, guys. All right. Speak soon, Guillermo. Thanks, Steve. Hey, hey uh, can I say something? Yes, sir. We should watch, we should make a point uh, when the quarantine is lifted and we can all go back to the theater. We have to do the promised screening of IMAX 3D of Pacific Rim or Collider. And Guillermo and I have talked about doing Pac Rim in IMAX 3D forever. If you have not seen it, IMAX 3D, you have not seen the movie. I count me in. As soon as we can. On that note, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks, thank Steve. You. What is storytelling? Storytelling started with our indigenous people. Can anyone give me an example of a myth or a story they're afraid of? Lucas. What's going on? We found a part of a man in the woods today. Part of a man? I guess the other half was found in the mine. All this has got to be an animal, right? No animal I've ever seen. Something is going on with Lucas. These drawings belong to a student of mine. This is what was in the mine. 
It's a diabolical spirit. Excuse me, this is a myth. For you, yeah. He's not your responsibility. He has no one. He is my responsibility. He'll come for me. He needs me. He's here.